this person is a monster. It's a subhuman. This person doesn't think like you and I do. This person is not going to make sense. Greetings, and welcome to John Benet Ramsey's Sketchy Details Part 9. If you have not watched 1 through 8, it's advised that you do because these are in chronological order. This and all videos in the John Bunny Ramsey Sketchy Details series are intended for educational purposes only. So number 58. So the popular word is that John Ramsey lost his wealth after the murder of John Bunny in the following years after her murder due to legal fees and buying his own investigative team and all that other good bullshit, right? And, you know, I would believe this when I think about how much money he spent paying people off, which I think was a lot of people, like certain lawyers and DAs and people like that. And just in case some people aren't aware of how much money it takes to pay people off to buy people... You must take into consideration that anyone who he would want or need to pay off would be already well off financially. So a measly, I don't know, $800 is not going to appease these people. Shit, $1,800 is not even going to be enough. We are talking a couple hundred thousand dollars per person for the more important people like DAs and judges. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you most likely could pay the lesser people off with, like, 20000 but it's not as though he'd only need to pay off, like, five people. There's, like, we're talking, like, ten people minimum. Plus, I really feel that, you know, for some people, it would have to be, like, a monthly payment situation for, like, the duration of the time that they were involved in this fucking case, like... No one is going to take a one-time payment to have to lie for somebody else for 25 years. Like, nah, that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? It's just, it's ridiculous, but I digress. So in Death of Innocence, John states that by 1999, he was broke and had to sell his plane. What he failed to mention was that he had another plane. But we'll get back to that in a second. So, in 2004, John campaigned for a seat on the 105th District of Michigan's House of Representatives. Needless to say, he lost, which, thankfully, but for those of you who are already kind of privy to what I'm getting at with John and, and this whole series, if you will, doesn't that seem like it's, you know, perfectly fitting like that, that he's going to go into politics like these people... They keep in company with each other, if you know what I mean. Anyway, moving on. Um, so I have a link that I will leave to where I found this, but certain people were keeping track of John's flight logs because he was claiming to have sold his plane. Well, he had another plane that they were tracking the flight log, and his flight patterns are extremely suspicious. Honestly, he will go and spend 15 minutes in some place that took him four and a half hours to fly and then just to fly all the way back so that's eight you know nine hours in a plane for a 15 minute ride and then go back to the exact same place the very next day for only an hour what is he doing and then it's like all over the place like it doesn't seem some of it could be like leisure and personal but it seems like there's some sort of businesses going on in all these different little states they're all over on the east coast and like you know the southern east coast and stuff like that i'll leave the link so you can go see because i'm not going to be too descriptive on that because just what i wanted to focus on was the fact that he had another plane that he's like flying around frivolously like all over so like jet fuel is not cheap people this dude is not broke okay but this leads me into what i found just the other day so in 2015, in Moab, Utah, a company called Red Tail Air was established. This is John Ramsey's new business. What he does is he flies people around the national parks in Utah. He's one of the only people that are certified and, like, allowed to do this. And it's his company, but there's no mention of him anywhere really, except for like in these little things that I'll also leave um, links to those in the description. So you guys can read that all for yourselves. But 
he, so now he has like five or six planes. So last time I checked, broke people couldn't buy planes, let alone fly them recreationally for other people. Not only that, but I found some juicy tea on that company already. So it turns out the FAA deemed his plane in the beginning unflyable, and he continued to fly people around for like another four months afterwards. But I want to clarify this just so I can make sure that nobody confuses this. Like the tracked flight logs that were all suspicious that I was first talking about were in 2007 and 2008. So they are not explained by his new company because the new company didn't happen into t until 2015. Just to clear that up. I want to bring that up also because like John Mark Carr, who we talked about in the last video, also claimed to be broke. And the reason why I brought up in the last video that he's been all over the world is because people that are broke do not travel the entire fucking world. They don't. In reality, the reality that you and I live in, that shit doesn't happen. And for these people, it does because they're not broke. These people are funded by a certain industry. We're going to be exposing that industry more and more in this series. Um, we'll get into that. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you already guess where I'm going with this, but I just want to, before I get into that, just bring out everything out on the table. All this stupid fucking sketchy shit that surrounds this case that points to evidence, in my opinion. So a little off topic for a second. Um, the entire time that you guys were waiting for part eight, I actually had a very good, very detailed part eight that I made that I was having a lot of problems with. My computer was being really fucking weird with it. And I ended up just scrapping it all because it was not happening. It would not load. It wouldn't go through. I couldn't even get it in different formats. It was just weird. And it had a lot of juicy details in there about, you know, these people. But so it's, I kind of, because I remember making it and remember doing it. So it's hard for me to remember if I've already told you guys about some of that shit. I don't think I have yet. So, but that video went right into the industry that I'm referring to. So I think that I'm gonna just take it a little slower, give you guys more foundation so that you guys can see because some of the shit is outlandish and it does seem unbelievable. But what we need to remember is just because we don't believe in these things does not mean that these people that are doing these things don't believe in those things because they do. And that's why they're doing them. So we need to take ourselves out of it. And just because we don't understand it or wouldn't do it, doesn't mean that these people also won't do it. Because they will and they do. But since we're on the topic of John and John's businesses, I figured this would be the perfect time to throw this in there. So hopefully I have it on this phone. I have um, screenshots that I saved from copyright websites and some other weird websites, but... They were showing where Access Graphics was um, like in operation <clears throat> and established or like, you know, like registered because you have to register your business. And so that's another thing, too. My bad. Uh, he didn't register his planes for a while when he was doing that red tail stuff. That's so that's part of that team. But <laughs> sorry. Back to the Access Graphics. Um, no, I'm not privy and up to date on how business really works, but I just found these things worth noting. So the company type of for Access Graphics was a foreign for-profit. Now when I heard that right away, I thought, what the hell? Like foreign, that's obviously from another country. Turns out, no. It's important to note that this is a foreign filing. A foreign filing is when an existing corporate entity files in a state other than the one they originally filed in. This does not necessarily mean that they are from outside the United States. But Access Graphics was registered all over. It was registered in Boulder, Boulder, Delaware, Michigan, Ohio, California. He almost had one in every fucking state. Now... I bring that up is because when you try to get the company description of what the fuck Access Graphics did, it changes based off of state. It's all relatively the same, but it's not exactly the same. Like, for instance, this one says, 
providing lease purchase financing and financing services to resellers of computer equipment. This one says corporate marketing and advertising services in the field of computer and computer related products and services. Those are like two different fucking things. And then this one says provides marketing business development, vendor relationship management, channel marketing and technical support for access graphics by a fellow group company based in the Netherlands. We all know that he had access graphics businesses in other countries as well, and that's another thing. People that are broke or a real small-time business doesn't have multiple offices, one of which is in another country. That doesn't happen. We need to stop believing these fucking idiots when they try to tell us that they're broke or that they're even close to being, like, on our level. They're not. But the main main reason why I brought all that up is because I wanted us to focus on the fact that it was a foreign for profit because that will help me lead into number 59. It'll help me explain number 59. So for number 59, I'm going to explain descriptively what I mean by Patsy writing the ransom note and Patsy having her own ritual planned. I now firmly believe that this was premeditated by Patsy based off of things that became epiphanies of hers. Um, Something happened, something snapped in her, and she was starting to see what was really happening. She felt that this was the only way to save Domine. So for 59, I'm going to give you guys all the things that I pulled together that made me come to this conclusion that this was premeditated by Patsy and the reasons behind it. So in order to link it to the last one, we'll start with the ransom note. So the whole foreign for-profit thing, I think, is why she wrote it in the ransom note. She wrote you know, that we're a small foreign faction. She was trying to bring attention to his business, that Access Graphics has something to do with the reasons that she snapped. Now, I'm going to say snapped, but I'm, like, I don't mean in, like, a weird way and she just snapped and killed her daughter. Like, no, this this was calculated for reasons that are really heartbreaking, honestly. And so, in a sense, I have sympathy for Patsy, I do not think that, I don't know, who knows, this could have been the only option. But anyway, I digress. So she put the foreign in the ransom note to relate to John's business, as well as the amounts, not just because of the Psalms, we'll get into that in a minute, but the amounts is because of his bonus. I think that his bonus and all these other checks that you see lying around the house she realized were payments for services that that John Bonet was employed for, for lack of a better way to say that. The overall ransom note in general has this not so secretive tone of disdain and anger towards John, as if she hates him for something. Um, the, I mean, I pretty much already told you about the ransom note in the other part, but the other signs are, okay, let's see. I wrote them all down because there were so many that I just, I felt like I had broke the case, you know, but no, there's still a lot of holes in it, but there's just things that I connected that I didn't necessarily think before. The only other thing on the ransom note, I guess, would be that, um, in the Bible, Genesis 118 is to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Clearly, that's kind of like, you know, somebody did something to separate the light from the darkness, and even though it was bad, God was able to see that it was from good intentions. But I went back and read some more of Psalms, and all of 118, like, relates to what I think Patsy was thinking right before she planned it, or as she was executing it. But for the most part, it pretty much starts at Psalms 118.5. And that is, out of my distress... And this is the ESV version. I guess that's English Standard Version. I'm not sure, because it changes, you know, based off of versions. But 
This one, five, is out of my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Six is the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Seven, the Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those that hate me. So before I continue with that, let's interpret that. So, um, she called upon God. God helped her see these signs that made her come to this conclusion. God is on her side, so she's not going to fear the repercussions for what she's going to do, because what can mortal man really do to her? So, the law, or her husband. The Lord is on my side as my helper, and I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. That one's tricky and kind of weird, because it's like... Is that the reason why she was never arrested? Like, did, you know, God really help her in that time? Because that whole, you know, six and seven really seems like it to me. Continuing on, so Psalms 118.8 is, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. So to interpret that in Patsy's way of thinking, it was better for her to trust in the Lord and in God than to keep believing in her husband and what her husband was doing or pushing for or telling her was okay. And nine basically says the same thing, except for instead of man, it says princes, meaning, you know, just higher ups, kings, authority figures. It's better to trust in God than the authority figures or not necessarily authority figures that you and I think of. Like I'm talking about like authority figures of this industry that I keep referring to. But 10, I already read you guys, but 10 is all nations surround me in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. Meaning all these people, these bad people are surrounding her and would come after her for what she's about to do, but she doesn't care because she's about to cut them down with this one fail swoop. They surround me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. She's cutting them off by cutting them off from John Bonet. They surround me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Just more, you know, her severing what they need from her. Thirteen is, I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. Fourteen, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has come, has become my salvation. Now to interpret that, um, she was being pushed hard by what was happening she was being pushed hard to fall from grace, to fall away from her belief system, her faith. Um, and then 15, you know, I've already read you guys that one too, but it says that glad songs of, you know, salvation and victory are in the tents of the righteous. Now, this version doesn't say victory, but the other version that I pulled it from does, and it says that people were coming from the tents screaming victory, and the tents were those of the righteous. She's the righteous one screaming victory in the ransom note. 16 is the right hand of the Lord exalts the hand, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Her right hand was the one that was tied up. 17, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. So she's going to stay around and show and be free because it was God's will. 18 is the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death meaning he's taking her daughter, which she is a loss for her, but she's not going to die. 19, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Taking John Bonet, like open the gates for my daughter, please, because she is righteous and I'm offering her up to you. 20 is, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. 21, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. That's her thanking him, God, whatever, for accepting John Bonet, accepting her, her atonement offering. Uh, 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's her. She's saying the insignificant person in this industry, this triage of, of sin has now become the cornerstone. She's turning the tables by cutting off the supply, cutting off what they need from her, which was John Bonet. So 23, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That is her saying that God is okay with what I'm doing right now, that he told me to do this. 
24 is, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 25 is, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. That could be interpreted as her literally play, praying, like, please don't let me go to jail and be incarcerated for this, or please let us get caught and let my husband and his industry and his business be brought down and let this be successful. Don't let this be all in vain, what I'm about to do. 26 is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Come on, like, she's coming from a place of good intentions with what she's doing, so bless her in what she's trying to fulfill. 27, the Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. Bind the feastal sacrifice with cords and um, tie it to the horns of the altar. We already went through that one. That one's very relative to what she did to John Bonet. 28 is, you are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. 29, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That's just more of her giving okay and giving her the green light to do what she's about to do. That's what I think Patsy took away from Psalms. That's why I think it was in Psalms. That's also why I think she decided to do what she did. And I think whenever John actually got that bonus check is when it clicked for her what was happening. And that's why she related it to God telling her what to do because it was 118,000, her automatically going to Psalms 118 and her thinking that that was God showing her that it was okay because 118 literally talks about that shit. So it's like pretty trippy, but there's more clues, but that's just, that covers the entirety of the ransom note. Let's look at the other clues that I think show that she did it premeditatedly, if that's a word. Well, there are more clues in the ransom note, but I've already talked to you guys about those, like the changing from attache to a brown paper bag. That's in reference to the brown paper bag that was found on John Andrew's bed. Um, it's up to you now, John. Seems like she's literally saying, okay, this is your mess. You clean it up, but I'm calling 911. Um, the whole fat cat thing and the the whole fact that it talks about not getting a proper burial in the ransom note signifies the importance of the writer like to the writer of a proper burial so that's just her you know either willingly or unconsciously admitting that like she could not have her daughter not have a proper burial but okay so more clues are the mind hunter book like come on they ended up hiring the guy that book is trippy it's like almost like a how-to for getting away with crime. It's kind of weird. Um, the arrow in the dictionary being pointed to incest, which I actually have a fucking picture of. I finally found one. Thank the Lord. Um, it's probably like one of the only ones that exists, but... She was peeking at Officer French the whole time through her fingers. Now, this made me think of back when I was younger. Like, me and my girlfriends could talk to each other with, like, just our eyes, you know what I mean? Like, we could tell pretty much what the other one was trying to relate just by looking at each other, you know? And maybe she was doing that in hopes that he wasn't going to be so uncomfortable by it and maybe stare at her for more than a few seconds and maybe pick up on the fact that she's trying to say hello over here, like, I'm literally sitting right above my daughter's body which I think is another clue, her sitting directly above where John Bonet ended up being found. Um, and then, let's see what else. Oh, okay. So this one, this picture right here. Now, in one of the previous videos, I said that I thought the head wound wasn't exterior because that she fell or whatever, but no, 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 no. So the flashlight originally was on the kitchen bar, right next to a pillow. You get where I'm going with this? She left it there because she used the pillow to muffle the hit on John Bonet. Think about it. Patsy was a very superficial person. She cared a lot about appearance. 
She wasn't just about to bash up her daughter's head, even though she's literally about to kill her daughter. She's not going to mess up the way her daughter looks, so she muffled it with the pillow. If you notice, the pillow is missing in later crime scene photos, but it is in the original ones like this one here. Um, I firmly believe that, but I already told you guys about the, the pineapple is related to Miss Jean Brody. She was literally trying to have happiness. She was feeding her daughter happiness right before she was about to kill her. Those are all clues of why I think Patsy snapped. Now, the things that makes me think it was premeditated were pretty much basically just her um, supposed premonitions that she had. And then her getting her daughter that gold bracelet. If you may remember, I was kind of tripping out about the gold bracelet. I was like, why the fuck does it say Christmas? Why not her birthday? Well, it said Christmas because this was the day that Patsy planned to offer her up to God. So, her premonitions were that she, for some reason, picked purple for that year's Christmas colors. Purple is, you know, Easter colors. That's a big difference between being born and being sacrificed, okay? She picked purple because she was going to sacrifice her. Sorry about that. Apparently my cat wanted to say hi as well, but her other premonition, Patsy's other premonition, was that the My Twin doll that she got that looked just like JonBenet when she was placing it under the tree or something, she saw it in a white dress in its box, you know, with the plastic covering and, you know, a box, and she, for some reason, related it to seeing JonBenet in her, a, a casket. And then, lo and behold, what does Patsy do? She goes and buys that extravagantly beautiful white dress just a month or two before Christmas, and that's what she ends up burying JonBenet in. So all of that piled on top of the fact that <laughs> just recently I purchased the Deviant Moon Tarot deck and I literally purposefully bought the deck so that I could do readings on this case. And the very first reading I did pushed me towards this direction that Patsy did do it, but it's nowhere near what everybody thinks or it's not like, coming from the same place that people would normally think. And I might, might share, like, a reading on that, but I'm very new to, to reading tarot, so I'm not, like, an expert, and, you know, I wouldn't want you to expect that, so. But that reading is what told me that I needed to be looking at John and Dawn. So it just started making me think, okay, there is something to Patsy's past and Patsy's dad being a 32nd degree Mason. Like, there's that has something to do with it. So that's why I came to all these conclusions. But I'm totally going to stop this one here because we're coming right up on 30 minutes. That's like a very long time to listen to somebody talk. Um, I thank you for listening. You guys are the shit for pushing past the overall appeal of my videos and being able to see them for what they're worth which is the information so there is a part 10 I believe that's yeah 10 we're on now and it's in the making and like always god bless evil on this scale is impossible to comprehend to know who murdered John Bonnet Ramsey would be to know what world we live in where we are 